Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Well, good morning, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. Those of you who are here in this room and those of you who are watching online. So we greet you on this beautiful, beautiful day. But um, Dennis ran across a saying that we've been saying every day ourselves, and I know other people picked up on it. He just saw somebody had posted... Um, thank you, Lord. This is another day to praise you or to love you. And so I found myself saying, another day to love you in the beginning of every morning when I get up. And you know, it really does start you off with some joy to start the day. And then we're supposed to be like Brother Lawrence and stay there all day long. So we thank you, Lord, that this is another day to love you. Amen. And Lord, we praise you for all that you're doing in the world that we can see and that we can't see because it's good. Now, the title of this message is Unveiling the High and Mysterious Prayer of Jesus. Unveiling the High and Mysterious Prayer of Jesus. And of course, what prayer that would be, that's John 17. But we're not going to start with the prayer. We're going to end with the prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but I was told when I got saved, start reading the Bible with the Gospel of John. And many people are told that, and it's still my favorite gospel. It's unlike the other gospels in in so much, of course, it, it reveals Jesus as the Son of God, reveals Jesus as deity. And... Um, So when I started reading the Bible, I started with the Gospel of John. I don't know how many times I read the Gospel of John before I went on to the rest of the New Testament, eventually went on to the Old Testament. But, you know, right from the beginning, I would open my Bible and I would touch it and I would realize this this came from God. God spoke this. This is real. This is... uh, and I had, before I got saved, of course, you say, oh, nobody can understand the Bible and, and stuff like that, ridiculous things like that. But as soon as you get saved, everything is different. And so you know, with me, the grass was greener, the sky was bluer, things looked different. I felt different because I was feeling the presence of God and then his word. But, you know, I think for the first 10 years I read the Bible. And um, after, I don't know how many times I read the New Testament, I started started the practice of reading the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament through once a year and the New Testament, however many times the, the rest of the year allowed. And I studied some. I, I did some Bible school work. But, you know, mostly I read the Bible for things that the Lord would speak to me personally, the, the quickened words. Um, and in doing that, I miss so much of the richness that's in the Bible. And one thing I did not know how to do, that this is the living word. It's alive. And we don't just read it. Um, you can read and study later during the day, but start off by drinking in. There's life on it. It's a supernatural book. And if you drink in the anointing, then you're feeding on the word. It's real. It's something, it's substance, it's substantial. It's something you're bringing into yourself. And I heard a very sad statistic uh, one time that only 19% of Christians even bother to read their Bible. I guess that's at all. Um, And you know, you can't live with your Bible just on your phone. I don't know about you, but I can't. I, there's almost nothing that I can read that I don't make notes in, that I don't underline. 
if it's not worth me taking things to heart, it's hardly worth me reading at all. And how much more so the Word of God. I remember back when I got saved, everybody brought their brought their real a real tangible Bible with them to church. And I don't know if we need to get our little Bible purses and and do that anymore. But it's so much more substantial. Oh, and not just to um, pick and choose verses here and there that you meditate on. The, the Bible is a book. It has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end. It you, If you read the Old Testament, it, you get the history of Israel and read in order what all God did and how he moved with the Israelites. And he's still moving with the Israelites right now as they're um, bombarding Lebanon, southern Lebanon, and Hezbollah um, strongholds right now. So, so things are heating up over there. But that's a history that has never ended, and it's never going to end, just like the history of the church is never ending, and it's never going to end. But I loved loved the gospel of John. And even when and I didn't understand it when it said, in the beginning was the word, I, I didn't understand that for quite a while. I still, I loved this gospel. And now I know that John, the gospel of John, is unique among the gospels. It's Jesus actually unveiling his purpose of why he's here and what he's come to bring us. And if you look at um, chapters 14 through 17, in the book of John, that's the very core of the New Testament message. And this is Jesus for the first time. These mysteries he's held inside himself since the foundation of the world. He gets his disciples all together and he's telling them all about it. And so those 14 through 17 are really a single unit. And... I have a little, I did, um, the, the first chapter of the Gospel of John is actually a summary of the entire book. And I did a teaching, it's, this is called The Secrets of Divine Life and Building in the Gospel of John. So the messages are still available. I think they're available on the school, available as, a, um, um, an, M, as an MP3 three download, but also there's the booklet. And the booklet's available also in a PDF that you can download. But I think if you're interested at all in a little more depth in the Gospel of John, that you might get a lot out of this. So um, I was wanting to teach on the Gospel of Matthew because we are anticipating the coming of the King of Glory to the church. That's what this outpouring that everybody's prophesying about is going to be. It's going to be the coming of the King of Glory to reveal himself as King to his church. And so I've been studying the Gospel of Matthew. And so this week the Lord took me to the Gospel of John. He'll, he will change our plans, you know. So... Jesus' prayer for unity. When we go to John 17, there are three statements in that I had not really, well, it's a repetition. First of all, in John 17, 11, his prayer, he's praying for the church, not for individuals. He's praying for the corporate church. He's asking his father that they would be one even as you and I, Father, are one. That's pretty huge right there, that we would be one with each other as close as Jesus and the Father are. That's pretty astounding. That's pretty close. And then in John 17, uh, 14 through 21, Jesus prays, sanctify them that they all may be one. And again, and as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Then he goes on and says that the world may believe. Well, there's something, if we do this, then this happens. And obviously, 
the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit want the world to believe. But there's something that we need to work toward, that we need to yield to, that we need to do so that the world will believe the truth of the gospel. And then finally, in John 17, 22, Jesus prays that the glory, Father, that you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. This is a pretty big prayer that Jesus is praying. And one thing we can, we can be, be sure of is, is if Jesus prayed it, it's going to happen. Doesn't mean it's going to happen for every believer. Doesn't mean it's going to happen for every group of believers. But this is Jesus actually building his church as a real thing. Not just in theory, not the church universal, but real corporate bodies of believers who are so unified that the glory can come rest upon them. This is what Jesus calls unity. Okay, let's go back to the beginning of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John does not start with, in the beginning was doctrine, and in it was knowledge. John 1, 1 and 4 says, In the beginning was the Word, and in Him was life. So we're going to cover life and building in the Gospel of John before we ever get to this high and mysterious prayer of Jesus. The Gospel of John begins with, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and that in this person, the Word, who was God, was life. So this is a very special life. Now we know that um, at the time of creation, everything was created through this word, this living person. And we know from these verses that in this word is life. Now, we know at the beginning there was divine life, but the world was prepared for something else. Another word that's used, zoe, in the New Testament, which means life, but it also means eternal life or everlasting life. And this life was given to be contained in something. First of all, in all the creation. It says that the, the heavens praise him, the trees of the field clap their hands, that in everything that was spoken by the word, the praises of God are there. Now, when something's given, something needs to receive it, right? I, I don't, I'm not going to walk around with a pot of coffee and just pour it into your hands, that we, there were vessels called cups made to contain coffee. All creation was made to contain the life of God. God created Adam and Eve as containers of his spirit, which contains life. Now we know at the fall of man, man's spirit was separated from God, made deadened and People were separated from God, but that's not what we were created for. We were created to be spill, filled with the Spirit of God and the life of God. Now, the Word, what does it mean, the Word? This is what puzzled me so much as a new believer. The definition of the Word, Jesus, the person, as the Word, He is the definition the explanation and expression of God. A word makes something clear that was formerly not clear. Now, God is mysterious. God was mysterious. When, you, when I first tried to read the Bible before I was saved, God was really mysterious. And he was so mysterious, I stopped reading it. Um, 
but Jesus the Word explains him. Jesus is the Word. He's the living Word. He's the living Word of the Bible. Jesus spoke the Bible. The Word is God himself. Now, in John chapter 1, there's an overview of the entire Gospel of John. In John 1.1, 1, 1, we start with Jesus, who's the Word, who is life. And let me just turn to a very good outline of the Gospel of John. And it covers the first chapter, an introduction to life and building. God gave life, eternal life, actually means life with a purpose, and that purpose is to build. So, next, it gives life's principle to change death into life. Man was dead, he was separated from God, and God gave life back to man's spirit. Life's purpose, then, life has a purpose, is to build a house for God. A house for God to dwell in. Then it goes on, life meeting the need of every meeting every man's need. Then it goes on the next chapter, life satisfying. The next chapter, life's healing. Chapter the next chapter, chapter six, life's feeding. The need for the thirsty, life's quenching power. Those under the bondage of sin, life setting free. Next. Um, life's shepherding, next life's multiplication, next life's washing in love to maintain fellowship. And that's the first part. There are only two parts in John. And the next, Jesus crucified, the next section, Jesus crucified with Christ going to prepare the way to bring man into God, God into man, for the building of God's habitation. And then chapter 17 is life's prayer. Jesus, who is life? This is his prayer for the for believers, for the church that he wants to build. And then we see life, life's process in death and resurrection for multiplication, and it ends with life in resurrection. That's the outline of the Gospel of John. So I think we should understand a little bit more about life and building before we get to Jesus' prayer, that we would be built up the way he wants us to be built up. Now, in John 1.1, 1, 1, we start with the person, Jesus, the Word, who is life. When we reach verse 42 of chapter 1, this same chapter spills, speaks of a stone. We see Jesus call, calling his first disciples together. All of a sudden, he's calling his disciples. He's calling Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and Nathaniel. He's calling them and making them living stones. The one who is life is making living stones. Jesus builds with stones that have his life. This is the beginning of Jesus building his church. God gives life to people, transforming them into living stones, and then Jesus builds his church with these stones that have life in them. We are not supposed to be a um, social club. We are not supposed to be a hospital. We are to be a people who are being transformed with the life of God. Right now, we're going through the Peace Challenge, a few more days of the Peace Challenge, where we're practicing living in the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus never got out of the fruit of the Spirit. That's the kind of life we're to be living. We're not in carnal emotions. Those are signals. Okay, we've got to get back to the peace of God. But every time during the week when we pray through something, exchange a carnal emotion, get back to peace, or don't even get into a carnal emotion, but just, no, I'm not going there, and I'm not going to lose my peace. We are being transformed by the life and humanity of Jesus. 
He's transforming us. And it starts out, we start out as lumps of clay when we first come to the Lord. And then he makes us living stones. And then as he transforms us, we eventually become precious stones fit for building. And we see the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation is built with precious stones. That's people who are saturated, saturated with the life of God. And they become people who, like Jesus, become expressions of our fathers. It's one with our Father, one with Jesus, one with the Spirit, operating in unity, and then being built together in unity. Now, the whole Bible actually is a book of life and building, but I think it's, it's showcased more in the Gospel of John than in any other single book. Now, let's start back at the beginning of the Bible. I said that this is the whole Bible as well as the Gospel of John. In Genesis 2, we see that when God finished his creation, he put man into a garden. The central item in that garden was the tree of life. The tree of life, of course, is God himself. The tree of life is Jesus. Now, we see there's a river in that garden. Near the tree of life, we see a flowing river. And in the flow of this river, we see gold, what's called delium, and onyx stone. Now, on our, what we call an onyx stone is not a precious stone. What in Hebrew is referring to here was a precious stone to them. And I'm not sure what a better translation would be, but it doesn't mean the same thing to the ancient Hebrews as it means to us now, which is a semi-precious stone. But there's gold, delium, which is a kind of pearl, and on its stone, precious stone, what do we see in the New Jerusalem? We see gold, we see pearls, and we see precious stones. Now, there are some commentaries that I've read that says, bedelium is not pearl, it's tree sap. And that just doesn't resonate with me. First of all, tree sap is hardly precious anything. And it's certainly not a building material for anything. So I lean toward the commentaries that say that delium is a pearl. And, of course, we know manna was the color of pearl. Now, out of the flow of this river, which is a river of life, we see gold, pearls, and precious stones. And so Genesis is introducing building materials that will ultimately be built into a building. The Bible begins and ends with life for the purpose of building. Now between Genesis and Revelation, there's a, the two ends of the Bible, there's a wide span, a lot of history. Now in the Bible, we see a history of building not only by God, but also by the devil. Just a few of the things built by God that we see is God built a garden. He built a woman as the bride for man. The word used for God created bara, Adam, but he built Eve. So we see here a picture of Jesus building his church, Jesus preparing his bride. So God builds a garden, a bride, an ark, a tabernacle, a temple, and ultimately in the New Testament, a church. And the devil built, has built, he started right away building, and he's still building. You can look around at the things that we're, we're praying against and asking God to, to turn around in our things the devil's built. And we are standing by the word that God's, God's going to cause them to boomerang and is going to switch over to something that is godly. Okay, now, what are some of the things Satan's built? Sodom and Gomorrah, the Tower of Babel, world systems, ancient and present, and the Babylonian system of idolatry and evil religion that we see in the book of Revelation. So, but guess who wins? Jesus, Jesus does, because it says that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the church. All these things. 
openings for hell that the devil builds, they are not going to prevail. The church is victorious. So, so we learn in the New Testament that the church is called into unity. Now, so much of teaching in the church has uh, measured on individual spirituality. And I mean, that's good. That's wonderful. You can look th back through the history of the church, and there have been so many individuals, uh, at least a remnant in every generation, who have entered into deep experience with God. However, you can look back over the past 2,000 years, and you can find a lot of life and a lot of spirituality, but not much building according to the ancient patterns of the church. When I got saved, um, I had gone to a church. I'm not sure if one single there was, single person there was actually saved. Um, um, I knew when I got saved that I didn't want to go to a church like that. So I started reading about which churches actually believe the Bible and teach the Bible. That was a good start. And so um, I went to a church and soon went to a church that had a little more life. It, right from the beginning, I leaned toward charismatic because guess what? Before I went to church, I had read the book of Acts. And so when I got to church, I looked around, and I mean, they were really nice people, but I said, this is not the book of Acts. I want, I want God's pattern. I want, I want that. And um, I guess some people would have said that that doesn't happen anymore. But I, my answer to that would be, why not? Why not? Why would God stop with this wonderful pattern that we see? Why would He say, you know, okay, no more of that? So anyway, I had, and then I met Dennis, and he had a heart for the same kind of living church that Jesus speaks about and that the book of Acts talks about. And then we read in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, Jesus himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the build edifying or building of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there's something in here that, that Paul is charging believers with that Jesus has given us people who need to equip the saints to build up the church unto this unity that Jesus values so much. And then the uh, when we planted this church, we got the verse from Ephesians 2, 2.22. Well, let me go back a little bit and start a few verses beforehand. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together has life and it grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So for 2,000 years, when I look back in history, I see some building, but I also see things that look pretty man-built. Not very many things that look Jesus-built. We can look back to the first century church as an example. And if you read the history of the church, you'll see how it was gradually lost. The life and the gifts and, and the um, unity and Everything that the New Testament talks about is gradually lost and slipped back into the very thing that the Old Testament has, which are types and shadows without life, without substance. So we also see like the Moravian Church in Germany, the Moravian 
Pentecost. And that's an amazing thing to read about. The early church prized unity and the individuals in the churches were built up together and the same with the Moravian believers. Actually, the, they had a, their own Pentecost and had a hundred years of power before they lost the spark. So for 2,000 years, building materials have been piled up, but there hasn't been much building unto unity. Well, for one thing, to have unity, Jesus can only build with his life in us. He can't build with my annoyances. He can't build with Brad's grumpiness. That's not fit building materials. So he's working that out of us as he transforms us. And then what is left when we have an adequate amount of his life in us, then he can bring us together. And I love when we studied Philippians because they were pretty unified. They had their weaknesses. Um, they were very a church that was very, very dear to Paul. But he's encouraging their uni unity. And then he says, please tell Eudia and Syntyche to stop quarreling. And wrote it in a letter that got printed in a Bible for every, everyone to read. Can you imagine? Do you think they repented? I can't imagine having my name written like that in the Bible for everybody to read. But it was the unity was important enough <coughs> that Paul obviously felt like he had to take some extreme measures. So Jesus builds with the life in us when we cooperate. We can have a congregation full of very spiritual people, but still have man-ordered services and no true unity. I love it that we've had people pull up in the parking lot outside and say they could feel the unity in the parking lot. So that says a lot for you guys, and what you have done in cooperating with the Lord in this process. Now let's go back just a minute and talk about this eternal life, this Zoe life, what is life. We know that, uh, <coughs> that God has divine life. Now eternal life or life is the divine life with a special function, which is to know God, to know Jesus, and know one another. Now, when um, we were teaching on the biology and how this all works in, in biology, we learned that human beings are unique, and it can be scientifically studied. It's actually called neurotheology, the, the neurological study of spirituality and how it affects people. Animals do not have spirits. They have souls, which is mind, wills, and, mind, will, and emotions. But God uniquely gave people spirits that can be filled with his life, and it can be seen in brain function when people get lost in the presence of God. You know that sensation when you're in prayer, you're yielding to God, and it, it seems like all of a sudden there's something changes. That change. And actually, you can even lose your sense of time. Well, that can be scientifically studied. And it seems that there's part of your brain called the orientation association area that is your perception of yourself. It is, it never sleeps. It is always active. Even when you're asleep at night, it's oriented. You're oriented in the room, in the bed. Uh, you, there's no earthquake going on. <clears throat> Things are stable. 
It is always active and functioning. But in scientific study, it can be demonstrated that that part of your brain that never sleeps, your sense of self, when people get lost in deep prayer, it's like there's a switch and it quietens down. That statement when John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. That's actually what's happening. That God made us with the equipment to discover God. We were uniquely created with the ability to know God. Now, there are levels of surrender. And we are told, when we're told to follow Jesus, Matthew 10, 38 through 39, we're told, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds or keeps his lower life will lose it. You'll lose that life you could have. And he who loses his lower life for my sake, will find this eternal life. So as we decrease, he increases in our lives. Now, how much we find of him depends on our level of individual surrender. Now, we can consecrate our self-life, our lower life. There are some people who are more consecrated than others, but we can still just live pretty much by self. Um, Reese Howell's intercessor, I've talked about that often, he talks about when it came down to it, it really frightened him to bring self to the cross, that he had a real struggle of almost a week with the Holy Spirit before he was able to surrender. So one of the things that we teach here is the three levels of the cross or the three levels of surrendering to God. And we can see it all, I mean, all the way through the Bible, all the way back, the tabernacle of Moses, the temple, and so forth, with the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Well, each of those is a level that, or a level available to us that we can surrender into. Now, it's also in... Um, 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, it talks about little children, young men, and fathers. And this corresponds to the three levels of surrender. Um, we've called it, I mean, people can call it different words. Some people call it uh, justification, sanctification, and um what was the other? Um, glorification. Glorification. You could say the levels of the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. First of all, the forgiven life. And this is the low gospel. The low gospel, by the way, is salvation for sin. And that's mostly what's preached and taught. And, and they genuinely have the life of God, but it's on a forgiven level. It's what what um, the Apostle John calls little children. <clears throat> then next, what we came into an experience, starting with Jason back in 2017, the replaced life. This is Galatians 2.20, which is, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the forgiven life, there is a struggle to try to live the Christian life, trying to live up to what you think are God's expectations, trying to be moral, let's hope, you know, to a reasonable level anyway, and um, to deal with your temper, to do the things you should, but it's trying with that, with your fallen nature. You're still pretty much trying to do it yourself apart from God. Dennis calls it the independent self. But praise God, we've got Jesus in us. 
we're no longer um, having to live separate from him. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, as me, and through me. And so it's a life of yielding. It's a life of yielding to him, stepping back, keeping your peace, connected with him. Peace is the indicator that you're connected with Jesus. He himself is our peace. And so it's a much better way to live. And the peace challenge is part of developing that as a lifestyle in your life. And the way we get our peace back when we lose it, of course, is forgiveness. And we get back in the fruit of the Spirit. And by the way, that's how you know you're abiding in the vine. Because guess what? If the life sap of the vine is not flowing through you because you've lost your peace, it's like you pulled your branch out of the vine. There's no life flowing through that. So you get plugged back in through forgiveness and the peace flows once more. And then the third, that's the whole, that's the living out of the holy place. Knowing Jesus is the bread of life, having the light of the lamp stand. And that's what the Methodist, that's what the Methodist movement was all about. John Wesley, the movement of sanctification, where they had the holy club to get together and confess their faults one to another in living the Christian life, except Jesus living through them. Now, toward the end of the 1800s, there were many of the Methodists who started saying they believed there was a third level. Some few may have entered it, but I really think that third level as a whole church-wide experience has been reserved for this end-time church that Jesus is getting ready to build. The third level in the Holy of Holies is the enthroned life. Trusting Jesus to live his life through us for the world. No longer loving self primarily, but allowing God to place the Father's heart in us so that we can live under the yoke of Jesus, doing the will of God, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, giving it up to Jesus to live through us for the world. And that's actually what they did in the book of Acts. It really wasn't the acts of the apostles. It was the acts of the Holy Spirit living his life through surrendered saints. And that turned the world upside down. Now the truth is, we receive all of this at the time of salvation. But who knows you don't appropriate everything you've received at the time of salvation. That some things you have to progressively learn. And it's a process of growth. It's a process of gaining revelation. So we've all, already been crucified with Christ. We've already been taken to be seated together with Jesus in the throne room of God in the heavenly places. Jesus said it in the book of John in the first chapter to Nathaniel. He said, I'm the Jesus stairway. I'm connecting the heavenly throne room now to earth, and you're going to see the angels of God ascend and descend on me, this heavenly ladder, this heavenly connection. That's where we really are. We're already in the Holy of Holies. It's, uh, it's already been accomplished. We're seated together with him in heavenly places. Now, the thing is, our revelation hasn't quite caught up with our inheritance, but this is what we're pressing toward. This, this is what we're praying for. That This is what we're yielding to, what we're believing for. And I believe it's going to be such a great discovery for the church that it's not going to be able to be hidden. That what's been said about this is God is going to invade our schools. He's going to invade our universities. He's going to raise up a, a mighty army of young 
like the Methodist circuit riders who are going to take the message to the world with the zeal of the Methodist circuit riders. And he's going to join together the old and the young. He's going to join together the generations to accomplish what needs to be accomplished on earth. And this is what we're anticipating. And Okay, now, so there are three levels of individual maturity, three levels of individual surrender, and also three levels of corporate surrender. And if you have your Bible, you might want to turn to John 17. And it starts off in, in John 17, chapter 1, which is life's prayer. The first point is the Son is to be glorified that the Father may be glorified. Now, when Jesus came to earth, during his earth walk, his glory, the glory that was still in him, was hidden. Briefly, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he allowed three of his disciples to see that glory. So this is right before the crucifixion and resurrection when Jesus said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Now Jesus was about to pass through death so that the concealing shell of his humanity might be broken and his divine element, his divine life, his divine glory might be seen. He uplifted his humanity into the divine element again that his divine element might be expressed. And of course we know his full glory is radiating from the throne room of God in heaven, and John saw that glory when he was caught up into the <coughs> heavens. Now, so Jesus is accepting his position of glory, and then he starts praying for his believers. So that to glorify means to express the glory, okay? Now, the first level of surrender in John 17, is John 17, 6 through 13. And Jesus says, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. This is Jesus praying for us. Holy Father, keep through your name those who you've given me, that they may be one as we are. This is the first aspect of the oneness. To be built up into one in the Father's name by the eternal life, which we've learned is this Zoe life. Now, this is the level of little children. This is those who have the life of the Father. They're no longer living by the prince of the power of the air who fills the world, but they, are, they have the life of the Father has been deposited in them. They have the same Father now. I don't know about you, when I was first saved, I was a oneness with other believers. I learned that later that there were a lot of differences between believers, but but at first this sense of being part of a family, sharing a life. And this is the, the first aspect. This is the first aspect of our oneness, the first element of our oneness. Mm -hmm. 
I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them through your name. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And this may be the lower level, but it's certainly an important level. And these, this level is verses 6 through 13. And listen how he ends this section. Now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in, in the world, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. We give Jesus joy, especially when we have some semblance of unity. We give Jesus joy that we are his, and he's bringing us together. And of course, we know that this prayer is a building up corporately. Keep them in your name. Now, when we say name, you can, when you close your eyes and just even think the name Jesus or Father, you can feel the life on that. The name is the nature of God. And it pleases Jesus when we acknowledge that. The second section, John 17, 14 through 21, speaks of the next level. And this speaks of the sanctification because God loved us and called us out of the world, but he doesn't want us to say the same. It's not like Mr. Rogers. He doesn't like us just the way we are. He wants to change us and transform us. You wouldn't be happy with you, um, to never see growth in your children, right? You don't want them to forever part in kindergarten. You expect them to eventually be self-supporting and, and have children and function in the world successfully. So in this second level, and, and this applies also to the word about bitter roots, Hebrews 12, 14 through 15, that we have, there's something for us to do now, the second level. We're, we've given up striving in our own strength. We're allowing Jesus to sanctify us. Hebrews 12, 14 through 15 says, pursue, and that means really, really go after this. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I want to see the Lord in the Holy of Holies. I don't, don't want to just know about being seated together with him in heavenly places. I want to experience that. And we know in the book of Revelation that to him who overcomes, I will grant to be seated together with me on my throne. That's in reality. I don't want, I don't want doctrine. I don't, don't want hypotheticals. I want real experience, and we've been promised that. So this second level is a level of being sanctified, transformed, set apart for God. And it says in verse 14, Jesus says, I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of this world even as I am not of this world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you would keep them out of the hands of the evil one. They are not of this world. We are not of this world. And then in verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And for their sake, I sanctify myself. Jesus did what was right he, in, before his disciples. I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. I do not ask concerning these only, but concerning those also who believe into me through their word that they all may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And if we don't act different from the world, the world's not going to believe that Jesus is real. Paul in the book of Philippians said that 
he magnified Christ in his life. In other words, he so presented Jesus that these, these Roman guards who were keeping him in prison, these guards from Caesar's household, that he told them about Jesus and he lived Jesus. He made Jesus big in their eyes. They may have never heard who Jesus was, but because of Paul's life, Jesus became great, became big, became huge in their eyes, and some of them even got saved. We need to magnify Jesus by our lives. And in John 14, one of this four-chapter group, Jesus talks about in verse 23, about he's giving them the secrets. He's saying, I'm going to be in them. They're going to be in us. Father, you're going to be in them. That we have access to the triune God, to Jesus, to the Father, to the Holy Spirit. That we have access to be one with Jesus. Now, of course, we still have the um, tendency to sometimes get back into that independent self and walk away from God. But our goal is being transformed to be in perfect harmony with him as a lifestyle. Now, verses 22 through 26. This is life in the Holy of Holies. This is where the prophets say that we're going. This is where the King of Glory is going to take us, that he is going to come. And we know that I saw, I had a vision of, it's like little upper rooms all over the world. And about the same time, the glory was exploding on these little groups of believers. And I believe that was the coming of the King of Glory, that this is going to be the time where the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And how do the waters cover the sea? Completely. The waters cover the sea completely in the glory. I saw the whole earth beginning to glow with the glory of God. Jesus' prayer will be answered. The third aspect of oneness is in the divine glory for the expression of the triune God. So Jesus, so God will be magnified to the whole earth through surrendered believers. There will be no doubt that we know God and he is living his life through us. And it said in the book of Acts that these believers turned the world upside down. I think we are in a world right now that desperately needs to be turned upside down because right now it's, it's um, the evil, the darkness is so dark that an upside downness must come. Okay, starting in verse 22. One in the divine glory for the expression of God and the glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one in the Godhead. I in them, you and me, that they may be perfected into one that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, concerning that which you've given me, I desire that they may also be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. And where is that? That's seated together with him in heavenly places. That they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these believers have known you, that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and I will yet make it known, so that 
the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the love that's going to change the world. This is going to be the very heart of the Father in us, where, where we love others more than we love ourselves, where we love obedience to God, where we surrender to him and cooperate with him, a people that God can trust, a mighty army of radical lovers of God and lovers of people in the world. This is what's going to get the world's attention, and this is where we are headed. Now, we have prayed a number of times for people to enter into the replaced life, the second level. Hmm? Okay, so let's pray. It's impartable. Once you have reached a certain level or something's been imparted to you, then you can give it away to others. So for anybody who has not yet entered the Galatians 2.20 level, let's pray it right now. And if you haven't received, receivers will receive all over again, you know, um, for a replaced life. Father, forgive me. I have been living life as a selfer. I've been trying to live the Christian life in my own strength. I see there's a better way. I'm not separated from Jesus. I'm not apart from him. He's always in me. All I have to do is yield to him. He's the only one who can live the Christian life. So I ask forgiveness and I repent and I welcome you, Jesus, to come live your life through me. No longer separated. It's you and me together. Now I receive this now as a gift. You've already done it. You've already provided for me. I now replace my life with your life. Thank you, Jesus. And if you prayed that, we have a couple of pamphlets in the back. One, The Replaced Life, and one, How Do I Live Now That I Have Received Jesus to Be My Galatians 2.20 Life. Call it Daily Life on the Second Level. We also have a little booklet available on that, but the pamphlets are on the shelves right by the door. I encourage you to get that and read that and practice living a whole new way of life. Okay? Well, thank you a lot, guys. Let's, let's get ready to go to the third level. <laughs> thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school, at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.